This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Well, thank you for joining us today. We have with us co-host Richard Fields. We have Scott Schmidt has joined us. He's the running for a trustee for the Los Rios Community College School District. That's a mouthful. And so, Scott, why don't you give you a chance right here at the top to give yourself a good... Give you a minute to talk about yourself and why you're running for Los Rios. Sure. So right now, um, as you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has really changed our whole environment in terms of how we will operate for our lives and everything else. And due to that, a lot of issues will, will start to arise from Los Rios. Um, the person I'm versing, who is the incumbent trustee, uh, created a measure called Measure E to create property tax on all homeowners and working families to build infrastructure. But the kicker is there's been a 30,000 less enrollment since 2013. They don't want to mention that to you. And now that COVID-19 is pretty much further dipped down the enrollment numbers. Um, now is going to be a massive loss of funding for staff, uh, teachers, administrators, and there's going to be furloughs. Eventually there's going to be firings. There's going to be salary cuts. And even if, as you've seen through SEIU 1000, which is the uh, public service union, they recently cut 10% of all their salaries across the board without even mentioning anything. There was no collective bargaining. There was no choices. It's told them the next day, you lost 10% of your salary overnight. So we are in a massive problem right now, and we need real leaders to stand up and do what's right and to know the right direction of what we should be doing with especially my race, the Los Rios trustee race. Um, I want to be able to deny all measures if it doesn't make sense, because right now due to the lack of enrollment, there's no reason to build more infrastructure. That's pointless. Um, I want to help students be able to have good jobs, not have high student debt because about 50% of uh, d degree holders currently work in underpaid or minimum wage jobs, even people I know personally, and they have tons of debt and they end becoming delinquent on their student loans because they can't afford to pay it. These these degrees have become a racket. You go to the school, they care about the revenue only. They don't care about your job training, your your ability to rise up the ladder. It, it doesn't exist anymore. It's all based on who you know, not what you know. So the whole system has become warped and broken. Now, uh, the, that would apply more to uh, a four-year degree uh, colleges rather than community colleges, right, as far as the high cost is concerned or not? Correct. However, a lot of the counselors within the Los Rios district are pushing you towards those four-year degrees. They're not pushing saying, the, hey, pushing, yeah. telling people, don't Correct. settle for an associate degree, go ahead and get your, your bachelor's degree. Right. So, so majority will tell you, you got to get um, so many classes to be able to transfer to a UC or a CSU. UC could be upwards to $20,000 a semester. CSU could be upwards to about 7000 a semester. That's a lot of money. It adds up. Yeah. And a lot of these people, even after they get degrees, they don't know what to do because we have just such a broken system that's based on just money. They don't care about what the actual um, final result's going to be for a student. They just don't care. Now, you're saying that the enrollment was down before the pandemic at uh, right. Los Rios? So and since now, the point with the pandemic, I'm guessing a lot of classes, if not all, are being conducted online? Correct. So um, it's going to be conducted online. They're going to end up having online own classes, uh, and recently, actually this morning, Zoom, which is the primary source of instruction now, it was down. Blackboard was down. So besides the technological issues, um, they're going to keep cutting classes because they don't have money to keep paying teachers if there's going to be less enrollments over and over again. So since 2013 to 2017, the numbers were 30,000 lost from that time to today, we don't know the true number. They're kind of hiding the information in a weird way. I don't understand. I mean, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I just don't understand why there's not enough data to show where these losses are coming from. Yet, we continue to pay more measures to raise uh, taxes on homeowners or raise sales taxes to, to pay for more infrastructure or more uh, pet projects. But for what? I mean... Why build buildings if they're going to sit empty? Is, 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 is that exactly. the, the, the yes. crux of it? 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, and that's probably which would be the case certainly with coronavirus, but probably Correct. even without, even without coronavirus, it would still be the case that buildings would be built Correct. for nobody to come to. Right. So and have, so yeah, have, go ahead. Gosh, have they thought about the future of what education is going to look like? Not just post COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in the future, we still educate our kids like it's a hundred years ago, and yet technology and information is now fast and cheap, but yet we still educate the same way. And they're still building infrastructure, as like you said, to educate kids the same way. Are they thinking about maybe creating the community college system from a different perspective? Instead of, say, everybody goes to school, you go to a classroom for every class. One of the things that frustrated me about community college was I took a business class. It took a whole year to take a class that I could have learned in about three weeks. Right. It wasn't a complicated class. We could have learned it in about three weeks, but it took literally took a whole year. And so for some classes where you can go, where some students can go online, is there maybe a, are they examining a more hybrid model where you have some physical classes and some remote classes based upon student need and type of class and that kind of thing? Uh, those do exist already. There's a lot of hybrid classes. Uh, I think the bigger issue is the direction. They're not directing them towards what they should be doing with their lives. So a lot of the counseling that's involved, they push, they push classes on you to take them, but they don't really tell you what you're going to end up getting from those classes in the long run. There's no path to, I'm going to get XYZ career and then I'm going to get paid this much money and it's going to make up the, you know, the reason why you're doing these classes. And that's the biggest issue is they don't have a direction. They just want more revenue from these students rather than help them find a job. I, I wouldn't even mind having uh, labor unions come in potentially and teach people apprenticeships or anything else, even have a program to do that because a lot of plumbers and uh, electricians and people who are on the ground, they get paid fairly well. It's a trade that, that's a lifelong skill and we still need those kind of people. So why aren't we teaching and bringing in these kind of uh, facilitators, facilitators that get these things done? I don't understand. Well, my yeah, things, like auto, like things like auto mechanic, uh, you know, you, you almost have to be a, a you know, a, a tech wizard in order to uh, fix a right. car anymore. Right. Well, and my grandfather's union used to do that, right? They would train people. Someone would come in and they would have a union would sponsor someone. Hey, this guy's a good guy. He's smart. Let's put him through our apprenticeship program and we can be trained to be, I think his case think was his projection, case. a projectionist, but whether it's an electrician or it's a plumber or there's a lots of, uh, lots of industries where apprenticeships and, you know, on the hands training and unions used to do that kind of thing. And they don't, there's still some, the welders union is actually pretty good about that, but the rest of these unions, they no longer seem to do that. Right. Um, and I think it's because the whole model has changed. They no longer, the, the public sphere no longer cares about uh, results. They care about revenue. Well, one but, of the interesting things I've noticed about the pandemic and the school shutdowns is that uh, a lot of uh, students, teachers, uh, parents are figuring out that you can learn pretty much anything that you need to learn, mm -hmm. at the, certainly at the undergraduate level, uh, through Zoom, through uh, uh, other uh, online platforms. Uh, and probably learn it quicker, more quickly and, and more thoroughly than you can sitting in a classroom being bored to tears and having to put up with uh, the, the, uh, the you know, goof-offs that are causing a, a discipline problem and if not a, a security problem in a lot of schools. Mm -hmm. And that we're, now that we're going online, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, if the, uh, you know, the old Bismarck model uh, that uh, James referred to the you know the, the industrial model of education where you have to sit in a in a uh, uh, closed clock, uh, closed off environment uh, you know with one teacher for twenty five or thirty students whether that's kind of destined to fail. Um, well, uh, I, I think uh, eventually it will. Simply there's some feedback, but um, I, I think it is destined to fail. I think uh, the European model is a little more better. I don't know if you you know the European model, but usually in uh, high school, they will kind of direct you towards a career that you can do, and whether or not you have a certain aptitude, and then from there you either go to academia or you go towards a trade school, and that's a better process compared to what we have now, which is figure it out. You, you'll figure it out eventually. It's 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 no problem. Everyone's going to discover it. A lot of people haven't. A lot of people have master degrees that are waiters. And it's not because I'm not saying waiters are being a waiter is a bad job, but I'm saying a lot of people weren't intending on having to wait be wait staff and also have one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in student debt. That wasn't their plan, and that's that's the biggest issue. 
Well, well I, yeah, ever, ever since the Department of Education was formed, and, and even before that, we've seen massive, massive inflation uh, at the uh, college level in, in, in tuition and uh, intuition right. costs uh, and fees. Uh, when I went to college back in the you know in the dark ages, uh, back in uh, the uh, '60s, I was able to work my way through college because uh, the entire cost of of, of uh, tuition and fees was $150 or less per uh, quarter. Uh, and even even at a $4 an hour wage back then, it was still uh, easily uh, uh, attainable. I can't ask my kids to do that today because it's simply the, the, the number, the arithmetic doesn't work out anymore. What's the difference? We don't have any better education product in terms of uh, test results or any other measure of the uh, educational quality than we did back in the 60s or the 50s, but we do have a heck of a lot more cost. And I, I would posit that a lot of that cost is going into administration and going into uh, parks and recreation, you know, the buildings on, on, on campus, the kind of things that uh, um, make uh, groundskeepers happy, but not, not very few other people. Right. And, and they, my headphones are a little... Okay, well, um, they have said a lot of the universities now, they call kind of Club Med. So they actually will have little spas, they'll have little uh, sports gyms, climbing walls. I mean, those are all great things, but that adds into the total cost and the inflation you're talking about. And, and to talk back to what you were saying in, in regards to when you went to school, um, you were in, in California, I'm uh, assuming. I went to school in Minnesota or in Wisconsin. Minnesota, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I know in the 1960s, uh, the university system here was free or close to free, very, very close. Um, but there was a proposition called Prop 13 that completely changed the whole landscape because primarily education was funded by property tax. So to make up that loss, they had to find other ways to tax us. And now we're in this huge issue now where we have tax for this, 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 this. And they continue to spend and spend and spend, and there's no end in sight. I'm not saying that I'm against Prop 13, but the quote Milton Friedman, property tax is the least bad tax, in my opinion, just like his opinion. Well, the issue with the property tax isn't actually the property tax. It's that it's connected to value, which is, you know, a completely individual. Like, how much is my house worth? Is my house worth what we paid for it, what my grandfather paid for it? Is it worth what somebody theoretically might pay for it now? Or is it worth what it would actually cost someone to get us to sell it? It's, it's, those it's, are actually vastly different numbers. None it's, of yeah. It, yeah. Well, it's actually based on comparable properties that are sold. Yes, but primarily there, was, based. there was an issue back there. Was just recently, I, I don't want to actually get too far off of the topic, right. but there was a, a farm recently that, down in the Bay Area that sold for $31 million that was appraised at seven. Because that's what it took Amazon to get the guy to sell his farm. It took him, you know, much above market rate. So what's the property value on that? Well, Amazon's going to have to pay the property value with $31 million, but it's really only $7 million. When you talk about property value, it's a very spongible thing. There's no such thing as property value. And that's my problem when you start talking about how you determine value on property is it's like wealth tax. Most of the wealth is kind of, it's a spongible number because everybody has a different idea of exactly how much that house is worth or that property is worth. Cause this house to me is worth a heck of a lot more than it's worth to anybody else. Right. And so if you want, yeah, I, I think, I think the economic answer to that question is it's something that's worth what somebody else will pay for it. Exactly. It's the market market value. Yeah. And, or what I'm willing to sell. If someone yeah, well, else willing to pay for it, a willing buyer and a willing seller agree on that's the price. Yeah, if I'm not willing to sell it, it's not worth anything. Well, well there's also uh, a lot of well, work. A lot more than you're willing to sell it for. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I do want to mention there are situations where that that doesn't really work. So, for instance, when someone has a monopoly on something, I mean, they could price it at whatever they want. Well, the only monopolies that exist are government created or government enforced monopolies. So the whole, you know, I, name me any monopoly that wasn't put in place, either put in place by a government or enforced by a, a government. That's 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 a it's, it's a non-problem in a free market. Well, heck, monopolies are actually a good place to, to segue to the next thing: the post office ballot hysteria and all the electoral problems. I have issues with mail-in ballots, but it's got nothing to do with the post office. The post mm -hmm. office is the least area of my concern with this whole mail-in ballots issue. Um, it's everything else. So. 
And this whole post office uh, hysteria, it's really become a hysteria. Most ballots aren't traveling across the country. They're traveling across town. And so this notion that this post office issues are going to dramatically affect the, uh, the election is kind of silly. And this whole thing has become a virtue signaling political football. I don't even know what to yeah, think. Yeah, what it is, it's, it's um, Democrats and Republicans trying to cover their rear end in case they lose so they can blame it on the post office uh, and, and nothing more or, or less. Uh, the problem, of course, with the post office is one of those government created monopolies. The Constitution allows for a post office to be created. It does not give the government a monopoly on a post office. There is no reason in the world why the federal government couldn't say, okay, you know, we've been losing money, literally losing billions of dollars with the post office uh, for, for, for decades, if not centuries. Let's sell it to the highest bidder, get it off our hands, and let anybody compete in the delivery of first-class mail. Right now, if you want to mail something first-class, the only choice you have is the postal monopoly. The, mon the problem is monopoly and government management. Well, the first post office, he just contracted with Benjamin Franklin. They, they, they didn't even create a post office. Benjamin Franklin had a postal service, and they just contracted with him. The, yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's no reason why the government has to own the post office. That's, no. that, that's unnecessary. They've turned it around. Yeah, Scott. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was going to say, there's also a historical figure named uh, Spooner, who actually had an alternative post office at one time. Yeah, and, it got shut down, if I remember right. Yeah, by the U.S. government. But... Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's an issue. Um, I hate to say it, but I feel like Trump is trying to suppress the vote. I mean, it, it, that's how some people win. They suppress the vote. Incumbents win based on suppression. That's, that's, that's a fact. And um, at the same time, Democrats win when there's a lack of suppression. So that, that, that's just how the partisan football kind of goes. Well, I think it depends what you call oppression. When you have, you know, they're essentially suppressing yeah. third-party voters. So it's not that they don't suppress votes. It's they just suppress their own type of votes. It's it's all voter right. suppression. And so, but it, back to this mail-in voting, the problem with my thing is with the mail-in voting is we now have to go and check to make sure our votes get counted rather mm -hmm. than just when we go, we used to go in, you go in, you vote, and now you have to get checked, make sure your signature matches, make sure they actually counted your, your ballot. And it's just, it's creating a more burden on the average person. It costs cost more, takes longer, and adds, adds burden. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, for people who need to vote absentee or who don't want to, I have no problems with it. I don't want to take it away. I'm not one of those people. But, man, you should really try to do as much in-person voting as possible. And I understand there's complications this year with that. And so I'm not upset one way or the other. But this whole notion where we should all be doing mail-in voting, there are serious problems with, with the – processing side of the mail-in voting. It's not the mail part, it's the processing side. It takes longer, it costs more, and it, it creates opportunities for not even malfeasance, just accidents, just, you know, people making bad judgment calls. It could be honorable bad judgment, but it just leaves open issues for problems, and I try to avoid yeah. Yeah, I, th I think we're going to be looking at a uh, Florida 2000, I forget it was, 2002 or something, or 2000, the election, 2000, the hanging yeah. chad election, where the, the, it took months and a Supreme Court decision before the election was decided. I think that's almost a foregone conclusion at the national level this year. Yeah, where how many signatures got, or does this signature count or not? And it's just, and someone like me whose signature never is the same twice. I always worry about when I have to sign the ballot. I have nerve damage on my hands. My thumb doesn't work. And so my, you know, my signature is never the same. And I got lucky the last time they accepted it. It looked close enough. I don't know. I just... And actually, when, when I did mine, mine was denied. I actually called them and uh, got really mad. And they said, everything is 100% correct. I don't know why they denied it. So even then, even when it's perfect, they still will deny it. But uh, I've always said the, big, the bigger issue um, is not who casts the vote, who counts the vote. I think it was because Lenin that said that originally. It, it, was, it was a leftist of some sort. It, 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 I've heard Lenin. it from, from Lenin, Stalin. I, it, it's from one of them. Yeah. Um, but there, there's so many issues, and I don't know if you know much about provisional ballot, ballots. Um, right now, you can go to, to any vote center in California and say, hey, I live on the corner of uh, J and 5th, and they'll give you a ballot. You sign it. No verification through the DMV. I know it's because I've talked to people um, who are registrars. They, they kind of acted kind of weird about it when I asked like, this question. 
and and they accused me of being uh, of a uh, hyper conservative Republican, which I don't I don't know where I got that from, but okay. Um, and I said, so how can you verify these people if you count provisional ballots ninety two percent of the time? And they said, well. How, how do I know you're not a U.S. citizen? I'm like, that's not an argument. You can't ask me a question when I ask you a question. That's not how things work. You either answer the question or you don't. So obviously, they're pretty much telling me at the uh, Voter Choice Act, which I, I went to like a little uh, thing at the SOS, Secretary of State. And all of them said, we don't know how much money this is costing. They're hiding the data, one. And number two, um, we have no system to really check these voters. The only way we check them is through addresses. We don't check citizenship. We don't check uh, where they come from. We don't check even their name, just addresses. Known addresses, and potentially you may have lived there once or twice. That's it. And even if it doesn't count, 90% of the time, they will count them as legitimate votes. So if you want to talk about... Sorry. Here, I'll, no. I'll take... No, that was me. Sorry. My lighting fell. We lost you, Scott. Hold on. There we go. I got it. All right. There we go. Sorry about that. No Technical problem. difficulties. Uh, so I, as I was saying, um, the bigger issue is they just don't verify anything. So they talk about Russian collusion or any kind of third party to you know manipulate the vote. If you're not counting these provisional ballots, how do you know who's manipulating it? You could have China or Russia or Europe or South America bringing millions of people over the border or over in planes and voting. There's nothing to stop them. If you're not counting the, the ballot, I mean, I'm not saying there's fraud, but what I'm saying is there's no stress test to validate whether or not it has good integrity. There's no backups. So if, if you're really concerned about it, why aren't you checking? Why aren't you doing it like the banks where you do a stress test on whether or not they're going to fail or not? I mean, it sounds pretty um, sane to audit your electoral system that matters so much and who elects leaders, I would think. Yeah, this, there seems to be a lot of... Yeah, but the, the New York Times and the Washington Post says, you know, there are no cases of water fraud, so uh, case closed. <laughs> yeah, well... The, I'm sure it's plenty, but the thing is, just because it doesn't, just because you haven't seen the story on it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'm yeah. sure we all know that. Yeah, well, most voter fraud is relatively small. It it, it doesn't matter a whole lot outside of the small local area that it uh, it affects. But you know, even that's important. You know, every every action in voter fraud should be, you know, it's it's important. Even if it's only 20 votes, and it but it could change the election of dog catcher. But who knows how long that that ripples go down. That dog catcher might get elected to mayor in 10 years. And the whole thing has been set up based upon some small case of voter fraud at 10 years ago. And it's you all very, we only, we only need to look at LBJ to prove that. God, Lord, Richard, <laughs> Richard, I tell you, it's speaking of LBJ, we're just going to go move on mass evictions. We have a September 1st, Scott, you wanted to talk about this one. So we'll go ahead and skip to it. We've only got a five minutes left. Um, right. Max evictions coming up. Well, the yeah. potential for mass evictions coming up where the, every, the protections for evictions go. And we also have a bunch of mom and pop owners who are need that income stream. And so we've got this competing morality. And how are we going to how do we deal with this? Well, well, first of all, if it's really based on whether or not they want to get funded, I mean, if the market really corrects everything, mom and pop would have to renegotiate the rent with the renter rather than evict them if they really want money and that default on their their mortgages, you would assume, number one. Uh, number two, um, there's going to be massive evictions or possible evictions by September 1st. Um, there's AB 1436, which allows for mom and pop apartments to have forbearance on their mortgages, have a uh, foreclosure uh, freeze, you could say, and that would allow people to stay inside their, uh, where they're living. And they would make an agreement with the tenants who broke these leases that they would have to then pay back whatever they were, would pay back. There would actually be uh, more, I don't know what would happen, but I'm guessing a possible garnishment of renters who would uh, bail on the rent. So they would make the renters liable if they do break the leases if this does go through. So they're trying to help both sides. And I think under the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns, the government should owe restitution to those they locked down. I mean, if they have no money, 
That's, that's, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, this is this is a, a prime example of the government breaking your legs and then handing you a crutch and saying, we're going to help you, you know, help you out a little bit. Uh, they broke our legs when they shut the economy down because of the coronavirus when it wasn't necessary. Now they're going to hand us a, hand us a crutch. And essentially, you know, if you're going to make the renters not have to pay rent and the uh, landlords not have to pay their mortgage, that just pushes the problem up to the banks or the or whoever the lender might be. There is no free lunch. There is going to be somebody that's left holding the bag. And right, right. the bag is created by the government's uh, malfeasance and governance uh, from square one. Uh, unless we address the underlying problem, which is the government really screwed up this this pandemic, we're not going to go anywhere with solving any problems. We're just going to make it worse. Well, the big issue I have is the government's going to bail out industries. They're already bailing out equities. They're infusing trillions of dollars weekly. Oh, for yeah. Bank operations for, through ETFs, literally distressed distress debt. Um, yeah. So I'd rather help people not hit the streets and help mom and pop because they're not getting bailouts. Everyone else is. Well, you know, I mean, you can certainly make that argument that if yeah. you're going to if you're going to sin, sin in, in the favor of the little guy rather than in the favor of corporations. Right. That makes a lot of sense. But, you know, the argument really needs to be to stop sinning. Uh, stop <laughs> screwing up the economy, you know. Uh, just because, uh, you know, corporations doesn't mean that we should bail out everybody else. We need right. to quit the bailouts. Uh, agreed. But at the same time, I mean, the system's so warped where uh, I don't feel like my own philosophy should be in the way of someone, whether or not they're going to have a, a roof over their heads. Certainly, there's a, an argument to be made for a, tr a transition to a a freer market uh, and a more responsible way of living than being uh, at the at the uh, at the mercy of government at all times. Yeah, well, I think this is the perfect example of what happens when governments manipulate markets. Uh, markets become manipulated; they no longer function, and then we say, "Hey, someone needs to fix this." Well, uh, okay, something needs to be done because the market's been manip yeah, manipulated and it's no longer functioning properly. But it's no longer functioning properly by the people who are now asking to fix it, and so. Well, I actually agree with you that we need to find something to do. I'm not entirely sure I trust these people to do it. To for whatever these solutions they come up with, with whatever they're telling us this is going to do, that it's actually going to do that. We have a long history get, of get, get all that. We can't trust the we can't <laughs> trust the burglar to fix the uh, burglary problem. And so, well, I, I actually agree. We need to find something out how to do, how to both help these people not get evicted or at least find some place to go if they do, but also at the same time, help these mom and pop operations, help this old lady who's rents her house and that's her living. That's her income is her house rental. And she still has taxes to pay. She still has insurance to pay. And so we've got to figure out some way to have this complicated conversation and actually help these people. And if it, this bill they've got going through actually does it, then I'm fine with it. You know, good Lord, we've got bigger problems to fry, bigger fish to fry of what government is doing than trying to get people off the, trying to keep people off the streets. I think if the one thing government should actually be trying to do is helping people. And if they have to help the people they've hurt, well, then we should actually make sure they do it properly. And I think making sure that the, both the mom and pops, the little guy, like we've talked about, they, they help the big guy, they, they'll buy junk bonds on the stock market, but they won't, pay off the rent for for little old ladies. And that is infuriating. And that is all the time we have. Thank you guys for joining us. If you, you need to feel more about Scott, go to fixlosrios.com. The address is right there on your screen. Thanks you all for showing. Thank you everybody for watching. And please remember from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast on YouTube and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.